Hi folks, welcome to the channel. If you're a new or returning subscriber, please remember to like our videos, provide comments to help us with continuous improvement to our content, share with friends and family, and most importantly, subscribe. Thank you. Okay. All right, cheers, cheers, Patrick. Okay, so you may mention of um, this, this, this term, uh, topology optimization. Now, is there a difference between topology optimization and generative, um, what do you call it, generative design? Are there differences in that? Yes. Are they similar? Yes. So I will try to be. Uh, I, will, I will try to give you my definition, and probably this is not the definition in the literature or, or very technical one. Um, let me try to give you my definition, which is fairly um, I don't know, which is not really scientific uh, or technical one. It's not a scientific and technical one. So topology optimization is a set of algorithms that allow you to create a shape based on a design space and a set of mechanical requirements. So you set your design space, you set your forces that forces or, or, or stresses that your component need to withstand, and then you're setting some sort of uh, geometry constraint in order to tell you know where you need a hole or where you want that component to fit with another component. Setting those requirements, then what happens really is that the software uh, discretizes the design space into little chunks of material of virtual material and then he runs uh, an fea mo an fea simulation to check what is the level of stress that happens within those chunks of material and if that level of stress is below a certain threshold those chunks of materials are removed and, and if you do this iteratively then then you get to an optimized shape okay the, then an optimized shape that performs perfectly within the set of design requirement and design space that you have provided at the beginning of the process. Okay, so, and you're leading to one solution. So there is one design outcome that you're getting out of the topology optimization process. In generative design is a little bit different um, in, in, in the sense that, well, some generative design tools that are available at the moment, they achieve they, they are very similar to topology optimization in the sense that they are tackling the issue of mechanical performances. So they do the same thing of topology optimization. So you are creating a, a, a design space, you're adding your mechanical uh, constraints that your component needs to fulfill, and all the different geometric constraints, and then you run the generative design. And, and on top of that, you're also adding some uh, some considerations about which manufacturing process you want to use, which materials you want to use. And based on all these variables, then the, the software generates different design solutions. Okay, and then, and then based on the different design solutions that the software has generated, you can pick up the best one for, for your case. So really, one main difference at the moment is that generative design gives you many solutions. Topology optimization gives you just one. But they work on the same application. Now, if you look at the literature, however, the concept of the generative design is it could be potentially much more broader. And it can be used not only for um, mechanical objectives, Lightweight reduction or or, 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 um, or, or rigidity, or <clears throat> but also for aesthetics. So there are generative design algorithms that you know you, you you are inputting more or less the shape that you want to the shape so the boundaries of the shape you want to achieve, and then the generative design software provides you a certain number of different aesthetic alternatives on how that shape might look like you know, with different styles. And that's a very, very quick way to explore the design space just from an aesthetics perspective. 
But you can do potentially this also for fluid dynamics. Okay, there are generative design tools that they allow you to create shapes that are optimized for certain for certain fluid dynamics scenarios. So generative design, it seems to me, and, and I don't know if that is the technical or scientific definition, but it seems to me that is a much broader uh, range of tools that they can do many more different things than just solving a, a, a mechanical design problem. You know, that's that's my my interpretation. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, much appreciated. Okay. So coming back to additive manufacturing, um, what are the technologies currently out there? So in terms of uh, the various groups, so um, the little that I do know, um, we know that you've got like your um, fused deposition modern. Then you've also got like your VAT polymerization and things like that. Are there any other categories out there that is relevant to industry today? Yes. So, I mean, there are, uh, there is, there is an agreement that there are seven categories of additive manufacturing currently. So, uh, material extrusion, which is probably the most, uh, the most famous, uh, because, you know, the old AFDM machines are based on that. On the concept of extruding material, uh, so it's probably the more, most popular at the moment because it's the cheapest. Mm -hmm. Then there is VAT photopolymerization, all the stereolithography machines, um, uh, as well as direct light, uh, direct light processing machines. They are using a photosensitive polymer and some sort of UV light to cure the photosensitive polymer and create the, the solid object. So those are two. Then there is binder jetting, mm -hmm. which is again a, a process in which you're using powder and then and then a printing ad, very similar to the paper printers ad, that just ejects uh, glue, a type of glue that, that glues together all the different particles. Then there is material jetting, the material jetting category, in which they uh, they are using again a photosensitive polymer. And then a UV light, but the difference within, between VAT and material jetting is that material jetting is using a printing head, again, very similar to the one used for paper printing. Then there is direct, direct energy deposition that is using um, a deposition head with usually either a laser or a deposition head, which is very, very similar to a welding, to a wire welding machine. Mm. Um, and, and the idea there is that you are either depositing powder and, and welding the powder to an object or just wear, welding a wire of metal wire to, to, to a substrate. Um, so it's all about, uh, then there is the sheet metal forming, sheet metal lamination machines. Um, again, this is a little bit of a niche um, in the sense that this kind of category are machines that they are using layers of paper and they are cutting the uh, cutting the paper using a laser or a cutter and then using glue to stick the to stick the paper sheets together and then you can remove the the, the components and then you are getting components that they have the consistency of wood but those is a little bit of a niche category there aren't that many machines out there um, and I think the last one is um, powder processes, powder bed fusion processes, uh, which are all the processes that they use in insulated chamber, uh, where there are powders that are coated on top of a building plate, and then there is a laser source or an energy source that um, either sinters or welds the powders together. So th th these are the seven kind of categories of additive manufacturing processes. Now, some of them are more relevant than others when it comes to industrial applications. Mm. Powder bed processes, they are fairly established because the materials that they can process have very good mechanical properties and, and, they, have, and they are reasonably robust and resilient uh, to, um, to external factors. And so they are 
widely used. They they they, they also provide some economies of scale, um, so they are fairly fairly much used. Then also the VAT processes, they are very much used for certain applications in the actual production of products. Uh, for instance, an example nowadays is um, insoles for trainers. Companies like New Balance and Adidas, they are making their insoles using using these VAT machines. And some technologies within this category, they have really uh, speed up the process of uh, um, printing components so that the, 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 the speeds and, and the manufacturing output is, is reasonably good. Then there is all the material extrusion processes. They are kind of like good for, um, they, they have some sort of industrial application when it comes to models and prototypes, some sort of actual productions, but they don't have a great uh, resolution, most of them. So they, they, they don't tend to be used for industrial applications. Um, energy depositions, they are used for, for big industrial, usually big. Um, big engineering components. Uh, they're very good at repairing uh, dies, impellers, big impellers, and, and these kind of things. And I think, uh, yeah, and then material jetting and binder jetting, um, I think they are a little bit more used for prototyping because the, uh, as yet the mechanical mechanical properties of the components you can made, make with those processes are not uh, uh, comparable to uh, or, or not as good as what is required for a final product. Right. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. So um, I know that um, you, 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 um, there's this um, design for IoT manufacturing network that you, you kind of like oversee. Um, do you want to talk us at the top a little bit more about that? Yes. So uh, yes, so so we we kind of like uh, uh, again we uh, we started working a few years ago on the idea um, that we wanted to connect the research community that we're working on design for IM within the UK. Uh, and then we are lucky enough to get some um, some funding from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council uh, to be able to support the development of this community. And then, so we started this journey, and and, and really, uh, I think it's been very exciting. We have developed um, developed few events, so all the network is based on on our website, our LinkedIn channel. But the main activity that we are carrying out are events focused on one specific theme or topic in Design for IM. So we had events on design for IM for electronics, uh, design computational design tools for IM, on uh, 3D printing textiles, the design of 3D printing textile, the designs of um, design for additive for healthcare and medical applications. So I think we 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 had a few events, and the idea is really to have an event which is led by a key theme research leader, uh, some other than than than. Uh, than the really core team of the network that, that comes and develops this event in which it tries to bring the best, um, the best expert on that topic from either the UK or internationally and really discuss what are the, what should be the future research agenda and the current challenges on a specific team, uh, within the D4IM kind of broader, um, broader topic. Right. Cheers. Sir. And, um, what is the nature of the membership? Uh, is there any uh, requirements to become a member of this network? No, no, no there is no requirement. I mean, uh, we, we have different levels. Okay, so so the first level is really uh, getting registered into our mailing list. So if you're getting registered into our mailing list, you just received, uh, you will receive all the updates about events, opportunities that are within the network. Um, and things that they are happening more widely, you know, other research institutions that they are doing events or activities surrounding the 4 am Then the second stage is to become a member of our directory. So our website has a directory of experts, of people who is actively uh, involved in doing research in design for additive. So and our directory really brings this kind of uh, 
experts in these fields. Um, and so the ability to be able to look and connect with the different experts. Um, and then I think the third one is our LinkedIn uh, channel. You know, uh, we have over 750 uh, followers at the moment. Um, so I think that that's another way, you know, we, we, we tend to post um, on, you know, on a daily or weekly basis news surrounding um, surrounding what is happening in design for additive manufacturing and, and, and related topics. Okay. All right. Cheers for that. Okay. So we're, we're getting uh, towards uh, the finishing line at, the, at this point in time. Uh, so um, my last but what question will be, um, what is your personal philosophy when it comes to design? Wow. That's a Massive question. <laughs> wow. Um, there, you can answer this in many different ways. I, I think towards the years, I always had a kind of like maybe a product development kind of mindset, you know, because of the kind of like things I've done, specific, especially at my master later on, you know, the idea of kind of like looking at manufacturing processes and think what you can do with them, okay? As opposed to probably a philosophy in which, you know, people are more of a user-centered philosophy, you know, in which they really look at what you, you really investigate, what user need, and then they try to design to, to, to tackle those problems and to tackle those challenges and, and to really reach out to users. Okay. So instead of having the kind of approach, um, or an approach that is more related to conceptual design and, and looking at the trends and looking at um, what are the, the new things that are coming out in terms of aesthetics and style. So instead of having this, those types of approach, I think my, my approach is more really looking at what manufacturing processes can do, you know, to which kind of innovation you can, um, you can get after them. What can you learn from manufacturing processes that you can then apply to make innovative products, you know, and products that can make an impact in, in, in to users and to people, you know. So I think there is, there is really an element of like looking at the technology and, and try to learn the technology and try to understand how the technology can be used. And in this case, how you can design for the technology to, to make something that then users, customers are going to benefit from. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for sharing that with us. Okay. So uh, my last and final question for any young person out there who's thinking about pursuing industrial design or product design or anything within that realm of things, what would be your advice to such a person in terms of what are the type of skills and knowledge base that they need to have Freehand before uh, pursuing um, such a program at a university level and beyond. And also, what are the additional quieter, softer skills that they ought to possess in developing to become a, a, a good design and effective designer? A bit. So, yeah, but to answer your question, I think I think the main the main the main thing is really is passion. Passion. Yes. So I, I do think that passion and motivation is is really, I think, the most important thing because you know if you if you have the passion and you really like what you're doing, then you are really going to improve it. You know, whatever whatever is your starting point. And, and you know, some people may start with a really really good starting point, and some people may start a little bit behind. But if there is the passion and the willingness to learn and improve. I think, you know, I think everybody can achieve and, 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 and become a great designer. What, why, on the, on the contrary, you can be a really skillful, uh, you can be really bright and really skillful, but, but if you don't really like what you're doing, you don't really like design, you're not really driven, then, then you, you're really not engaged and you're not really uh, make the most out of it. 
Okay. So, so, so to me, passion is really important. Yeah. I, I definitely agree. You do need to have the, the passion for it. Because again, if you don't have the passion for it, then what will motivate you in developing those skills that you need to become an, an accomplished designer? So, so yeah, so that's, that's quite interesting. I think I'll just squeeze in one, one last question. And this is something that I've, 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 uh, it's kind of like being like a debate, uh, especially, you know, uh, when I'm speaking to people that come from the industrial design. Uh, background Um, because when you really look at the scheme of things you realize that the foundation if you if you stripped away the arty farty bits as i like to call it you're left with more or less the engineering elements of it so you do have a situation whereby you know uh, the traditionalists tend to kind of like you know turn your nose down on the engineering elements of it but when you really think about it you know no matter what you do, there's always going to be that engineering aspect to it. So from your perspective, right, from your perspective, do you think a modern day designer needs any of the engineering fundamentals in becoming an effective industrial designer? I think I think you need a variety and, and, and a range of skills. And, and engineering and, and also arts um, are, are a part of that, that set of skills, you know. So, so, so designer, design kind of like is very broad and you need, to, you need to have like a little bit of understanding of many different things. Mm. Engineering is part of this mix and is part of this menu, you know, all the things that, that you need to uh, um, that you need to know to become to become a great designer, because you need to know, you know, possibly, possibly, uh, um, what you know, what you can achieve. You know, what, what can you achieve with a certain type of material and with a certain type of technology, manufacturing technology? What is the final outcome? How good it is, and what are the alternatives? Are there any better alternatives? Um, and, and I think is, is really, is really the mix of all these things. So it, it, the mix of understanding users, the mix of, um, be able to conceive and, and generate and be creative about what, what the answers to the user problems might be. That's also very important. And in with that mix of creativity, then there is also that element of like, how can I make it real? Mm-hmm. And that's where engineering comes in, you know. And say, okay, well, yes. So I know what is the problem of the user. I know, I think I know what he wants. Then you get the kind of great creativity to, to kind of scope and explore what might be, you know, the best solution for that. And then you kind of need to kind of think, okay, so how can I make this real, you know, economically feasible and, 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 and performing and, and then where the engineering really comes in within the mix and, and, and makes, uh, um, it makes, you know, a good industrial designer, a well-rounded industrial designer. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for, um, giving us some of your time during the day to, um, to allow me to interview you, to get an insight into, I mean, what you do. Um, some idea in terms of what design for additive manufacturing is about and the capabilities that that technology has uh, within the realm of um, design and engineering. So, so thank you very much, Patrick, for uh, dedicating your time. And to the audience, um, until the next time. Thank bye. you all for reminding me. I'll see you. Uh, so. Bye. 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 Bye.